Okay, I hope I'm audible. Um, they'll, they'll let you know, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let me. All right. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, actually. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for giving me a second chance to present. I was supposed to present the last time. I missed it. And thanks to other teams for finishing early. So, uh, I'm working alone uh, on this uh, simple concept of building a distributed spanning tree. Uh, the applications are uh, very uh, pretty uh, uh, generic. Uh, one of the applications are like uh, you know, companies like Facebook, where they need to deploy configs to uh, servers spanning across uh, globe. So uh, they they use like uh, one of the solution that they have. They use uh, this tree topology to distribute the uh, the configs. So let's look at the uh, overview. Uh, so first, I'll discuss the, what the topology is, the architecture protocol. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll give a working demo and, and, and some of the future scope, like things which I have not been able to implement yet. Uh, so that's in the end. So first of all, a very simple topology. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about other components, how the uh, packet flows, and uh, but but a very high level, this is how it looks. Uh, the root might seem like a single point of failure, but you could have like a, uh, like a horizontal scaling at root as well. Uh, the, uh, and, and then there are like children nodes which receive updates from the uh, upstream uh, uh, you know, server. So uh, uh, one key thing uh, which I was trying to implement is uh, each of the children node uh, to, uh, as a fault tolerant, they will have certain backup links. Uh, in the picture, the one in the orange or the yellow, they, those are the backup link. So for example, node E, which is like at the bottom left, the main parent for the node E is parent uh, node A, but then node E also maintains uh, you know, uh, whereabouts of its uh, siblings, which is node D, and also the uncles, which is like B and C. So for example, in case of fault uh, failure, uh, node E can decide whether to go to uh, uncles or the siblings uh, you know, uh, in certain priority. So, th so, so uh, the topology is very simple. Uh, it's a tree structure. Uh, in the back end, like, uh, the tree structure like, looks like this. Like, I have a like, bunch of parameters for each of the nodes that, that I store. So the one in, uh, particularly of interest is the node ID and parent ID. So you could see the, the one at the top is the, uh, is the root node. And then root has like two children. So you could, like, for each of the node, when the node come online, they can define what their capacity is, like how many children a node can serve. So in terms of tree structure, that means uh, what is the branching factor of each node. So here, uh, for capacity of two, uh, you could see on the right side, on the rightmost, I have capacity left. That means each of the node, how much more it can serve. So with capacity of two, uh, each of the node has two children uh, until the, the leaf nodes, which do not have any children. So they'll have capacity left as two. So the top one is the root node. And then the next two are the children of the root node. You could see uh, you know, the arrows show that. And then the subsequent layer. The depth is like the tree uh, depth, like the node, uh, the depth of the node in the tree. I have assumed that the, that the root is at uh, depth of one. Uh, you could assume zero, it doesn't matter, but assuming the root at, is at depth of one, all the children's, uh, they have the subsequent depth at two and three, and so on. And I'm, clearly you could see the, you know, the branching factor of two, so uh, the number of children's increase exponentially. Uh, in, in, in reality, actually, you could have much higher uh, branching factor uh, because uh, one server can, depending on you, the load of your uh, you know, uh, application, how much data you are uh, transferring, you could, have, uh, you could tune the branching factor so that your node is not uh, overloaded. Uh, so a bit more detail uh, about the topology, uh, how the data flows and what are other uh, services. So first of all, like I said, uh, root, we can set it up as a uh, you know, horizontal uh, stateless service. Uh, so uh, th there are certain key APIs, you know, the way the, the nodes interact. So first of all, whenever a node joins a cluster, it talks to a metadata server. Metadata server is a very simple, uh, uh, you know, it maintains a very minimal uh, uh, state of the cluster to figure out whenever a new cluster, a new node joins, which uh, should be the parent of the new node. 
so metadata server stores like uh, whereabouts, which it receives periodically from the uh, the other nodes in the cluster. So I'll talk about what uh, whereabouts are being sent. So you could see on the right, uh, each of the node, they publish whereabouts to the metadata server. And all of this is like config driven. So when I walk through the code or the demo, I'll, I'll show that. So assuming that they are configured to send uh, their whereabouts, uh, and the, some of the ideas in the whereabouts will be what is the depth, what is the capacity left, and uh, who is the, uh, I think, uh, what's like the children count. So based on these information, metadata server can, the, or the service can decide which parent is the best uh, to pick for the new node to join. So new node talks to metadata server as an entry point to the cluster, receives a parent, and then go, makes a, a RPC call to the parent, which it has been assigned to. And, the, and then it receives the siblings and uncles, like, and, and this happens periodically. Uh, all these communications happen uh, over RPC. I've used like gRPC uh, to be precise, uh, the implementation. And uh, so, so that's pretty much it. Uh, the whole flow looks like a node, a new node joining the cluster goes to metadata server, asks, asks for the parent, receives the parent back, goes to the parent uh, with a join request, and then receives siblings and uncles, uh, and and then and 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 you know uh, starts receiving updates from the parent. In case of failure, it can uh, use the state it has about the cluster, like in terms of siblings and uncles, uh, to do a, fail, a failover uh, switch. Uh, so you could see here uh, on the on the left, like if the parent of E dies, E could go to B, uh, you know, because uh, there are like certain priorities there we, which you could define. One obvious is that if one of the uncle is free, then the node should go to the uncle because then you are not uh, adding more uh, height to the tree. So, so yeah. So, so a very high level, uh, there are two things in the whole picture. Uh, one is the infrastructure communication. Second is the application on top of this uh, infrastructure. So infrastructure is responsible for maintaining this cluster, the tree-like structure. Uh, the application is the one which will work on top of this to uh, like, you know, uh, do the actual data transfer. So, the two can interact with each other, like uh, more like in, in an event-driven style. Like infrastructure will be responsible for managing that the node is part of the cluster and, and do the switch in case of fault uh, failure recovery. Uh, application will be responsible for like receiving the data actually from the nodes. I have implemented the first part. I have not like uh, uh, you know been able to implement the second part yet. Uh, but but idea is like very like uh, simple, uh, you know, the application layer and infrastructure layer, they can like do a message passing to communicate that the, these are the nodes, the children nodes, which you need to send the data to, and then they'll start sending the data. And the, the, the children node, the application process in the children node, they'll receive the data usually. So uh, for the APIs, uh, you know, the uh, very high level, there are like three APIs. One is the data flow API, which is like being used by application layer, uh, which I have skipped for now. Uh, but the second ones are like the cluster uh, for the cluster reporting, uh, health reporting for the cluster, and the metadata service. So first, let's let's look at you know step by step the how the metadata service looks like. So <clears throat> whenever a new node wants to join a cluster, it sends a join cluster request to metadata server, and this is uh, the, how, you know the the protobuf definition for the R, I mean the RPC request which the metadata service supports. So it supports primarily two services. Uh, I mean two APIs: join cluster and publish whereabouts. Join cluster is the one which uh, the new node sends a request to metadata service. The join cluster request and the response looks like uh, shown here. Uh, so in, in whenever a node wants to join, it, it sends like what its capacity is, like the initial capacity, which it is like initialized with, and what the node ID is. Node ID is optional here, uh, keep in mind. Uh, actually, uh, the metadata server assigns node ID whenever a new node joins, uh, but have uh, still marked it as optional in the request because sometimes when nodes restart or recover from the failure, they do not want to be assigned a new node ID. New node ID. They could like reuse the node ID which they have been assigned before. So it, this helps in like uh, doing a, uh, you know, uh, tracing where the node is in the life cycle of the uh, whole service. Join cluster response is simple. Uh, metadata server just returns what what the parent looks like. 
uh, sorry, what's the parent is for the node and uh, what is the depth you know, uh, in the tree uh, and, uh, uh, and, and what's the node ID is, of course. Uh, the node is, like the node object type is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it has the endpoint URL and the node ID. Endpoint is like the host and port. Cool. Uh, so basically, uh, metadata service maintains the metadata about uh, you know what the cluster is like a very and it's not very uh, heavy heavily loaded because you could see it receives requests only like periodically from like uh, all the nodes in the cluster. So even if you have like a few hundred nodes, it can it can it can easily handle that. So. What is and, and each of the node maintains its own internal state, which we, we can call it node state. And based on that, uh, this information, it can figure out which uh, you know siblings uh, or the uncles to look at in case of failure recovery. So, what are node state like? So, some of the key uh, uh, you know fields that it maintains is, of course, who the parent is, which endpoint they are located at. Uh, what is its depth and all the children, siblings, and the uncles, right? Uh, uh, keep in mind these are like uh, uh, not persistent. The siblings and uncles they are like in memory. So, so it uh, because in, in case of failure uh, happening, the node needs to know what the new siblings or the uncles are because they could, you know, move in the tree. All right. So moving on, uh, so how is the whereabout request look like uh, or, and the whereabout response? So whereabout request is like a periodic request which, uh, which each of the node publish to the metadata server and what they publish is the children count, how many children they have currently, which helps metadata, metadata server figure out what's the current load utilization of the server, the depth, figuring out, you know, uh, assigning a new child uh, to a node with lower depth. You know, and then the uh, uh, what its parent is and the node ID. As a response, it receives like just 200. Nothing. Uh, not, it doesn't need to send anything. So first API was the publish whereabout, which we saw earlier uh, that each node periodically makes a request to metadata server. The second one is the uh, the node manager service, like how the nodes figure out who the siblings and the uncles are. So this is again periodic uh, peer discovery. So once a node is assigned to a parent, nodes makes a request to the parent to you know uh, give me the siblings and uncles. Uh, again, the two RPC calls are join parent and get siblings and uncles. Uh, so the join parent is again simple. Uh, after uh, talking to the metadata server, a new node goes to the uh, uh, the assigned parent node to do the the handshake you could say for establishing a, a you know parent child relationship. Uh, Sibling and uncle request is uh, again simple. Uh, sibling and uncle response is like it returns a list of siblings and uncles, and also also the grandparents because sometimes you may not have uncles which are uh, available to you, and if the parent dies, you go to grandparent. Like the whole uh, you know tree shifts upward, the subtree. Uh, again, uh, so, so all of these uh, the state which is maintained is such that it facilitates uh, you know the movement of the tree or the subtree in case of failure happening uh, joint parent request is again simple uh, just sends a you know node id and receives a response back and of course uh, to start with when you send a joint joint parent request the parent returns uh, uh, you know uh, the siblings and uncles even though there is like a separate RPC call for getting siblings and uncle periodically, but uh, as an initial state, when a request is sent, it receives a response. In, in, in response, it receives siblings and uncles. Uh, all right. So, so some of the things which I have not implemented yet, uh, but but then they are very clear uh, how to implement it, given what has been implemented so far and the APIs that have defined. So first is the get new parent in case of failure. So this is like a, there's no RPC call, there's no uh, uh, you know uh, call over the, uh, a remote call. It's a, it's a local computation. Given the node state, I have like the node knows what the siblings and the parents are. It can one naive approach is it can random, randomly pick one of the uh, uncles which are uh, still available and try one of those. If it receives a, a reject request, which a node would re send, 
if it is full or serving to its full capacity. In that case, it will try another one, and then so on, until it finds a parent which is like available for a uh, you know, request. So the get new parent does that. It, it, it takes the straight, the siblings and the uncle, and then computes what the next parent should be. The trigger parent switch is like the event-driven switch. So that means uh, what's the event we are talking about here. So the event could be uh, if whenever there's like a disruption in the flow, like uh, let's say application server sees that the upstream connection has uh, you know, uh, died. In that case, it can send an event to the uh, cluster manager service uh, for like do a parent switch. Then cluster manager wakes up and then uh, you know, computes what the new parent should be and then sends a joint parent request. And the joint parent request is uh, all we have already seen before. So that's, 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 that's all the summary of you know, uh, handling the uh, failure. So demo, uh, all right, boring stuff. <laughs> so I hope it works. So first of all, uh, uh, just, just give me a second. Uh. <clears throat> okay, I. Uh, okay. Yeah, I. I hope you can read it. Okay. So, uh, so the whole setup is like I have uh, uh, broadly uh, four services. I mean, three services. One is uh, as a as a database for metadata server for storing it. I didn't have to like store it, persist it, but still I'm persisting it because in case metadata server uh, crashes, it can come online and will have some outdated uh, state of the server. I mean the cluster. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to have like a more up to date state uh, because it anyway receives all the state periodically from the cluster. So, but but as a database, I'm using the Mongo. Uh, 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 and then I can I can and I can spawn all the cluster nodes in the metadata server. Uh, for managing all of this uh, on a local node, I have like uh, used Docker. Uh, each of the individual services are uh, managed as a Docker uh, is individual Docker containers. So if I show you the uh, the whole service definition file, it uh, they are like. Uh, Okay, so the, these are like the uh, broadly in node service and the metadata service, uh, and the database, of course, is the Mongo, which we have looked at. And each of those I can scale uh, separately. Metadata, I can have multiple instances of metadata server as well because they are stateless. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, start the metadata service. And uh, So you could see I have metadata service up and running. Uh, once I have the metadata service up and running, I could uh, initiate. Uh, I could start. Uh, you know, let's let's start with the root node. So where we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at this database, uh, which will you know, which I showed you in the very starting, the tree structure. So right now there's no node in the cluster. So let me add one node. Uh, this will very likely become a root node. Uh, you could see on the top, uh, metadata, metadata server uh, received a join cluster request, and it is, that's what it is sending, a response back. The first node, it receives, it, there's no parent to it, so node ID and the endpoint URI is empty. Um, and, and here we'll, of course, see uh, one single node. No parent ID, depth is one, capacity left is two. Uh, so now let's uh, go ahead and add two nodes in the, uh, I mean, let's add two more nodes in the cluster. Uh, now, uh, they're like, so, so you know, metadata server receives the request and sends a response back. Uh, for one of the nodes, it says, uh, you know, what the parent is. So that information is shared. Now, the question is, uh, how are the children assigned to the parent, right? Uh, there are different ways. Again, it is configurable. Uh, one is like you do round robin stuff, like you assign one node to each of the, you know, available parent. In this case, there's only one parent, but eventually, as the tree increases in size, you could have multiple uh, uh, nodes available to assign in a same layer. But uh, to keep it simple, I have started assigning all the nodes in the in the in the order of their capacity left. So in this case, uh, two nodes were added to the parent. You could see parent has the two children. Uh, let's let's go ahead and add like uh, you know uh, increase the size of the cluster to like total ten nodes. So um, 
So hopefully it is up. Uh, let me also show the logs of Node. So if I if I see the logs of Node, let it let it let the cluster stabilize. Okay, it is done. So let, let, let's let's see one screenshot. So so one of the request, I mean in, as 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 a response which the server receives, the Node server, you could see here it receives uncles and the siblings and the grandparent, right, as a response back. So with this information, a node can maintain what the state of the cluster is uh, and, and do the fault tolerant uh, switch. So here uh, you could see one of the nodes, it receives siblings, uncles, and the grandparent. Uh, if you look at the, in the back end, you could see here uh, the capacity left for the first few nodes are zero because they are the internal nodes. And the nodes which are like the bottom ones, bottom half, they have still some capacity left because they are like the leaf nodes. Uh, and, and, and the endpoint uh, is also saved because that's how they communicate with the you know, endpoint. Uh, however, even though I have like uh, set up the whole thing in a local setup, uh, they, each of these services can be deployed on a remote servers. They do not have any uh, correlation with uh, being on the same node uh, per se. Uh, each of the individual nodes can be actually, if I, if I had to, I could, uh, each of the individual containers I could deploy on multiple uh, different servers. Um, yeah, so you could see here uh, in the metadata service, it receives periodic whereabouts uh, from each of the nodes, and uh, it just takes note of that. Uh, same thing in the node side. It receives uh, like periodic uh, health, uh, I mean, you know, response from the node the parent node about its siblings and the uncles and the grandparent. I, I could not come up with better names, so bear with the uncle and siblings. So, all right. Uh, cool. Uh, so this is like very simple high-level uh, overview. Uh, uh, l l let me know if there is any question. I think I am I'm like done. So the future scope. Uh, quickly, let me summarize that. So these are the things which are left uh, as a future scope, which I plan to implement next uh, but but the idea is like simple. Uh, it's uh, uh, there are some of the things you might wonder like what happens if uh, uh, the tree is like complete. That means uh, any new node which is joining uh, joins the leaf. But then what if the internal node dies and all the internal nodes are serving to full capacity? How do you do fault tolerant? Because you cannot switch to uncle. You cannot switch to guarant. Uh, I mean. Uh, sorry, you cannot switch to siblings or the uncles, right? So that's why in the end I added a grandparent uh, because then if all the nodes are full and my parent dies, I could switch to grandparent. Uh, effectively, like removing parent from the cluster and then making the the subtree of the parent as a new uh, child of the grandparent. So, so with with the information available to me, like the uh, which are like the siblings and the grandparent. Uh, any node can uh, figure out, you know, to do the switch during the failure. Uh, the whole uh, the, the topology is very uh, simple in a way, uh, because uh, I mean there's, there should be like minimal overhead for maintaining the cluster state. The actual workload should be dedicated to application layer. Uh, if it is like uh, multimedia streaming, in that case uh, the bandwidth requirement will be much more. Uh, the reason for using gRPC was. Uh, uh, as a quick recap of gRPC, it's, uh, it helps. You, I mean, it's it's on top of HTTP two. But then a uh, lot of the requests which we make traditionally over REST or uh, so all of these messages which are uh, which we are sending has high payload cost because of the fields uh, and 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 then uh, you know the, the marshaling and demarshaling uh, the cost which it takes at the uh, at the uh, end host. Uh, in, in gRPC, we have this protobuf. Uh, we, we are using protobuf, but you could use something else. But uh, with protobuf, you can define uh, in a very structured way how your request looks like. And that is like uh, binary, uh, I mean, it is serial, serializable in binary format. So that means the end node can know how to uh, parse the binary in a very uh, systematic, uh, structured format. You, uh, the fields are not sent over the wire, only the values are sent. Uh, and this protobuf, and the reason is because the protobuf file is like shared from uh, at both client and the server so that's how they can like uh, they need not know what the fields are they can figure out the order of the values and then uh, extract the fields from there um, 
yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Thank you. Yeah. Just leave it there. Okay. Yeah. That time we clapped before. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Uh. Okay. Well, thank you to share. I know we're we have like two minutes left. Three minutes left. Um, as Tushar was presenting, uh, the, the, the first thing that came to mind and should come to mind is scale. Uh, imagine you have an application that goes viral from zero to 10 million customers in, 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 in a week. You know, you're going to reach that point, we're going to deploy a bunch of VMs with a bunch of virtual switches, with a bunch of load balancers, and just spin them up at virtual machines. But then the question is, how do we integrate all the pieces together? You know, we add another cluster with another set of VMs. There has to be an elegant way for us to incorporate that in the existing architecture without just creating a loop or just full meshing every single cluster to any other cluster. So this model, I mean, even though you spin it out as STP, I mean, you can address STP easily by just having an, a, a, a normalize the deployment or the interconnection of new switches on the fly. Hey, go to the server, figure out where you belong, come back, and you know, yes, you're still gonna be far, not be able to join the tree and be able to speak with any other switch, but you're just not gonna come right connect randomly whenever you want, you know, from any point in the tree structure. So, I mean, that's one application. The other one, CDN. Again, you can just deploy more CDN capacity, more servers. CDNs have to have a parent to register to. Hey, who is the parent that is near, my, near me that I can query information if I don't have it? Well, who is gonna be my sibling? You know, another server in the same cluster that might have some of that cache, and I can help with the volume of requests for the same data. What if my parent dies, you know, can I heal myself automatically and find the grandparent and don't need to, you know, go and register again and tell me who am I and who else is my, you know, I can connect. There's so many applications there that I think are, you know, were worth mentioning that this sort of architecture, even though it's a graph, is definitely has so much value in terms of scaling out, you know, massively, just deploying more clusters and replicating, um, environments and adding those environments or set of extra nodes devices into uh, the working uh, environment or the production environment gracefully. So I think that's definitely something that I wanted to highlight out of your presentation, even though you just, you know, focus on one network component. Um, I mean, at some point, all the network functions that we discuss become a virtual machine. I mean, be ready for that. I mean, all the larger players, cloud providers, all the networking rules, all the load balancers, all the routers and switches are just virtual functions running on top of physical infrastructure. And they have this challenge of how, even in virtual form, how do we interconnect virtual switches with virtual default gateways, with virtual load balancers. What happens if a load balancer can only handle 10,000 connections, but we, now we have 100,000 connections. We need to replicate more load balancers in order to deal just with the connection volume. And then how do we add them in a way that we don't take down the whole system or you, know, you break something? Well, guess what? It has to be some sort of centralized control or method or architecture that will facilitate the addition of these components or replicated components into the existing infrastructure. So anyway, I, I want to highlight that because it's like, this is actually very, very important. I mean, you just focus on the graph architecture for one small network problem, but the applicability of this is tremendous, okay? So definitely want to commend you on that. So um, any questions for Tushar? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see some of you on Thursday, okay? Take care. Recording stopped.